you know, a lot of people never open their own firm and really the business aspect isn't ultimately important to them. But to me, it, it ended up being very important. So this is episode 94. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we talk about tips, strategies for running a successful and profitable architecture practice. Uh, generous support is provided for today's show by BQE Software. They're the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built specifically for architects. And you can get, if you're a startup firm, you can get, uh, let's see here, you can get up to two seats of the software absolutely free for a full year if you're a startup firm. Um, I encourage you to go check that out. Once again, thanks for supporting Business of Architecture. And today I'm gonna, we're going to continue our conversation with architect Peter Tui. Peter is the owner and principal of Tui Architects based out of Baltimore, Maryland. And this coming April 1st will mark 10 years in business of Peter's firm, Peter's practice. So, Peter, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Enoch. So, congratulations. I mean, 10 years is a big year. And mm -hmm. one thing we left off in last episode, which was just a few minutes ago, but, you know, you talked about, listen, I'm, I'm a sole practitioner. I've been doing this for myself for, you know, almost 10 years now. Let's talk a little bit about scaling the office because you're talking about how you right now have too much work and you're thinking about what it might take to mm -hmm. get an employee or have someone to help you with your work. What are your what's going on right now in, in that regard and your thoughts? Right. So so for me, I, I use ArchiCAD, right? So that, that's a very important part of my business because um, and it's on the website, but but visualizing in three dimensions to help my clients do that, ArchiCAD, I know Revit does a similar thing and there are others that do that too. But ArchiCAD is the one I know and uh, it's the one I use. So any employee would have to be an expert at that. So what I've started now is I've hired a, a, an architect um, who's, who now helps me get that work done. He is better at ArchiCAD than I am. Um, and so you know, that's, that's like a, a step in that direction of hiring somebody. So I contract him out for 15 hours a week and that's, um, uh, you know, he helps me immeasurably, you know, get through this, this work that I have, which, which again, it, it leads me just to be able to have more clients, all that kind of stuff. So, so that's, that's good. So, but right now I'm at that point where should I, you know, again, you know, I think the economy's turned finally, and you know, the phone's ringing, the internet marketing is working, the one from Two Architects is working, the home show work is very steady. So, so it, it's a pretty easy decision on the one side to hire somebody. I've just never done it, so I know there are a lot of questions, and I'm really just at the beginning stages of asking those questions, and I don't know what the answers are going to be. And frankly, I don't even know what all of the questions are. So like I told you before, um, you know, my uh, mentor, so Bruce Finkelstein, he's, uh, I'm having lunch with him next week, and these are the questions that I'm going to be asking him because he's had employees, and he's the one who, who jump-started my firm, and he's going to talk about, you know, the pros and cons of both, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. I'll let you know. Excellent. Wow, we, we look forward to hearing that. So you did mention that, you know, well, let's talk about time a little bit as a, as a sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I know just in my experience, doing you know being a sole practitioner, mm -hmm. I personally don't see how it's really possible to do everything that's needed to run a really pr profitable firm as a sole practitioner without some help. So you know, let's look back at the previous ten years and just tell me how do you manage your time, and where do you find most of your time spent in terms of running the the practice? Right. So so when I started the. Uh... Ten years ago, it was was with with Bruce and Kitty, and so Kitty did absolutely everything that wasn't design or uh, work in the field. So she even met initial uh, potential clients, and you know, which which is a, an enormous amount of time. You know, just answering the phone, and you know, because you, you can imagine the phone calls I would get. Uh, one, and I'm not making this one up, by the way. Uh, one person wanted to know if I would go out to his house to see if I could make the dormer bigger 
in the house, the existing norm of bigger. Yes, I can't, but I don't have time. Yeah. You know, so, so, you know, and then, and now this person wants to tell me all about their architects, whatever, and, all, and, and, and I know by the end of the phone conversation, I'm not doing anything. For you know, I want to be helpful, and, and I, I know that these, this person is going to talk about this experience to somebody, maybe, and, uh, and I want it to be a, not a negative experience for him, but at the same time, it's, it's a complete non starter for me. And, you know, so I've had questions about, you know, basement windows and I refer people to Scape Well, which is a, a decent product that, they, that can help them, but I'm not interested. And, uh, and you know, it's, well, I find it kind of amazing, by the way, that people call like an architect for those projects, but 90%, I think as a minimum, when they have a, a real project, call a contractor first. Hmm. And, and even though the contractor really can't do much for them until they have a drawing, um, not even a legitimate cost estimate, really. I mean, if they're doing, you know, because who so knows what's going to happen by the time, you know, the design is finished. I, I never know, you know. So, uh, but still to this day, um, you know, again, like I get a lot of my referral work is, is from contractors. And, and I actively treat them really, really well for several reasons. One, they absolutely deserve it. You know, they're extremely talented. They work very hard. And they're really smart, um, so they deserve it. I mean, I remember when I was a young architect, um, so I was probably about 30, so I wasn't that young. And my new boss and I went out on site, and the contractor had a question, and he said, and I'm again, I'm not exaggerating, not even a little bit, he said, any deviation from these drawings will be a deviation for the worse. So all you need to do is build it exactly the way it's drawn and not ask any questions. And, uh, and I thought this guy was a hero. You know, he was a real architect and, you know, and th that's exactly the way an architect should respond to any kind of question like that. Mm. And then it took me about a year, and, I, and I'm giving myself the benefit of that, it might have been two years, um, to figure out how just insanely wrong that was. And, and it, it took that long. So, you know, but I've thought about it because I was proud of him, you know, at the time. And then now I look back at it and say, you know, that's a valuable resource and, you know, cares about the project, especially in residential design. Um, you know, the contractors are in, the, you know, the residential arena for the exact same reason that an architect would be. And the opposite is also true. If they're not in residential design, it's for the same reason. And that is you like the personal connection. And if you want that, then you're in residential. If you don't, then you're in commercial. It's the same for architects, same for contractors. So they want to do the best job they can, and they want to help. And so for me, you know, I'm, I'm looking for their advice. I'm looking for um, what they can bring to, to a project. And if I think their idea is every bit as good as my idea, not better, but every bit as good, I want to use their idea. Because then I know they get invested in the project. And um, and so that's a, so it's a marketing strategy, really, what it comes down to. But it's... But it, it, it's in the reverse, though. In other words, it's not really a marketing strategy, but it, it's ended up being one. Um, for me, it's been a, um, you know, I use them very, you know, again, I get a lot of referrals from, from contractors, and I like it that way. Do you have any special uh, procedures you do with contractors, or how early do you bring them into the process? Do any sort of preliminary pricing or anything like that? So, yeah, so that's a good question. So the... The second best way to do a project, in my opinion, the second best way is the way I do it most of the time, which is you do the conceptual design, which for me is the floor plans are pretty well squared away, not 100%, but they're 90 whatever percent, and then one elevation. So, so it's the front elevation if it's a new construction. It might be the back elevation if it's an addition or whatever. And that gives the contractor an idea of size. It gives them an idea of quality. It gives them an idea of complexity and detail, and then they do a cost estimate from that. So, you know, it slows down the project, and they, um, you know, it takes usually somewhere between two and four weeks to get a good, you know, estimated cost of construction. Um, you know, and so then, then the, but it's a, it's a cold shower normally. Normally it's more money than what people thought it was going to be, and um, but it's early in the project. So I divide up the, the um 
contract into three equal parts, you know, conceptual design, developed design, and then construction drawings. And, um, and that's one third of the way through, we've got a pretty good cost estimate that, you know, I have several contractors that will guarantee that number within 10% or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So um, that's the second best way to do it. And it's a great way, but it's only the second best way. The best way is to have the contractor and the architect on board at the very, very beginning. And, um, and so now we're all a team, but the only way to do that is you have to know and love your contractor. Because, I mean, you know, the architect's commission is nothing but it's peanuts compared to what you're going to be pay paying that uh, contractor. So you have to know and love that contractor before the project starts. Most people can't. You know, they just can't do that unless they've known that contractor, they've worked with them before, um, that kind of thing. And, and if you're in that boat, that's the right boat to be in. But again, the second best way is a pretty good way. Mm. So when the contractors give you those initial estimates, there's no kind of understanding. I mean, you're not paying them for that. They're just saying, hey, here's my bid, and this doesn't commit you to using me in the future. Right. And it's not a bid. It's an estimate. Correct. So, yeah. So it's a – but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty close estimate. You know, again, like these contractors I've worked with for decades, some of them, and, um, and it's – you know, I know what they – you know, I'm working with a client right now who has a, a – a, uh, an estimate from one contractor I've never worked with and one I have. And I said, well, the one that I've never worked with, that might be a great estimate, all that, but it really doesn't mean much to me because I don't know what that is because I've never worked with them before. Mm -hmm. The one I have worked with, I know exactly what that is. And so, um, so we could talk all you want about the, um, the first one, but I can't add anything to it. I mean, we're really at this, you know, my client and I have the same amount of expertise on that number. But the second one, now I've got some expertise on that. I know exactly what that means. So it's um, it's it's uh, it's it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. How do you help clients choose a contractor? What's that process like? A recommendation? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of feel like a, a little yenta at times because you, you know I tell people it's it's like like a, a what? A yenta. Yeah, I'm like I'm uh, yeah I'm uh, yeah filler on the roof at you. Okay. And um and so the. Uh, uh, I, I, I tell them it's a little bit like a James Bond movie. You don't go into a James Bond movie wondering if with about eight seconds left on the timer that James is going to save the world or not. Of course he is. And you're not even wondering if after that he's going to get the girl. Of course he is. You know, so, but how that all happens is why you go to the James Bond movie. And it's the same thing with contractors. So you're not wondering whether or not they can build it. Of course they can. You're not wondering whether or not it will be great when it's done. Of course it will. The, um, what you are wondering is that process. And, you know, people's personalities make a big difference. So I tell people to rate the contractors, interview three, if they're going to do the second best way to do this. Interview three, and then if they don't like one of them, off the bat, interview a fourth. Some people want to do more anyway. I don't think it's that beneficial. But five always seems like too much. Two is never enough, so three or four. Um, and then rate them, one to four, however, um, before the numbers come in. And be brutal. Give them a, a one, two, three, and four, and there are no ties, right? And so, um, and then the numbers come in, and you see normally number one is, you know, and again these these the contractors change. You know, in other words, the uh, the there sometimes contractor A is less money than contractor B, and sometimes vice versa, and then C same thing. So. So I never know where the bids are going to come in, but, but I do tell them that, you know, it's just like Murphy's Law, that the number one is not going to be the least expensive. So then you have some choices. Um, and sometimes number two is saving enough money and was close enough to number one that it's worth it. But if the relationship isn't right, then it never gets better. So, you know, years ago I had uh, somebody choose um, a contract. This, I go over this, this carefully because of this experience. So they saved a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars on a hundred thousand dollar project. So one percent, um, and they chose a contract they didn't like because he was the least expensive. To, but they chose a thousand dollars difference. Mm. And um, and by the end, I had to stand in between the two of them. They wouldn't speak to each other. And so you know, the contractor would say, "We have to move that window because of whatever." And, and then I would say to the client, "Well, we have to move this window because." You know, and then she would say to me, well, I can't move that window because of this. Well, we can't. Oh, wow. It was awful. And it was, again, a personality thing. Neither person was good or bad. You know, their personalities completely conflicted with each other. And um, so 
you know, and you just never want that. It's not, it's not, um, it's not beneficial to you. It's not beneficial to them. It just is bad all the way around. So the choice of a contractor is one of, if not the most important aspects of any residential project. So you approach it, sounds like a very consultorial process, come in as their advisors. I'm sure a lot of architects take that approach. Right. You know, here's, here's the facts, and I'm, I'm here to assist you and help you, but I can't make the decision for you. Yeah, um, and I also make sure that the, the, the bids are apples to apples. You know, Again, one time, one of my contractors, who's normally on the lower side, was on the higher side. And I was looking through the bids, and I didn't see anything different about it. So I called him, we were talking, and, and you know, I told him that he was the high bidder, which was, has never happened before. And he goes, well, I wonder if it has anything to do with the basement they asked me to add in there, which I didn't see in his number, so I'm looking mm. for something. <laughs> so, so he had, like, yeah, so I put in a number, and then I found it after he said it. It was like 20000 bucks for this basement, and that was part of the reason that he was so high. Nobody else had that. They didn't mention it to anybody else. They didn't mention it to me. Mm. You know, so, um, so it's just like one of those experiences, just trying to make sure that it's all apples to apples as much as it can be. So, Peter, we, we started out talking a little bit about time constraints, about productivity, and you've been a big-time uh, Archicad user for a long time. Right. How did you start? So one of the things that I've always thought about BIM is that it could be a potential time saver. Do you find that it actually does help you in terms of time of construction drawings, or are there other benefits? There's, well, well the huge benefit is, the, is, is you make this 3D model, and you know, I sent you some, some uh, images, um, but the... But the, uh, the 3D model is critical that my clients fully understand their project before we start building. Mm -hmm. And so I don't try to do one or two renderings per project or even three or four. You know, my goal is, and I say this, it's unlimited, right? Because I make this model, I put a camera in a certain spot, wherever they want it to be, inside, outside, anywhere around the, the, the home. And, um, you know, I've, so the most someone's ever asked for was 40. So I did 40 renderings for one home and the way I do this is because that model is made you know and I have to make the model to get the permit drawings because it is not only the plans but also the sections and the elevation so once I have this model done I have to draw the model in the right way and there are a couple of little tricks that are technical um, that, that make the, the model um, better than the minimum I'm not trying to do a beautiful artistic rendering I'm trying to give a whole picture to the uh, to the my clients and uh, and for years I would like you know my, my classic stories I showed a model to my boss because I worked on Archicad at my previous firm for 10 years wow. which, yeah which was why I wanted to use it for mine because I was extremely familiar with it when I started with Archicad you know again 20 years ago um, I was horrific at it you know, so I was using it as a 2D drafting tool, uh, which is, it, it, it doesn't even work that way. Mm. So, so it'd be like, uh, you've used Revit, right? Correct, yep. Yeah, so, so trying to draw elevations with Revit as a 2D drafting tool, not using the modeling at all, was what I was doing for a year or so. And then I, you know, again, at least I learned, right? Um, but the, um, but the, the getting the, the model to be so good that from any place you can do a, um, a you know a camera view and so you know one story a, a client of mine her name was Karen we were talking about a, a pendant light over the, the breakfast room she chose a beautiful pendant light it was about half as small as it needed to be so I, I said well wow, this is the, the best pendant on the planet it's still not big enough so we can't even consider it unfortunately so we have to pick a different one and and then she asked, well, what about um, this view from the, from the kitchen into the family room? I said, well, I had to have shown you that. And she goes, I don't think you have. And um, I look back in the plan, and all these little camera icons are exactly where views are. And sure enough, she was right. I hadn't, which was kind of bad. You know, looking from the kitchen into the family room is a pretty typical view that people would want to see. Mm -hmm. And um, so I made it right there on the fly. We're still on the phone. And, uh, and I did a screenshot and sent it to her, email. And she opens up Rima, oh, Peter, it's beautiful. I said, well, was that a question? And of course it's beautiful, but, you know, the, uh, the, you know, but it was that fast, you know, so seconds. And that's the only way to do this, my opinion. You know, again, because, you know, I, I would say like 90% of my clients tell me or straight off that they can't visualize in three dimensions at all. And I think the other 10% are lying. So 
the uh, and they, they really can't. I mean, like as an architect, I'm um, I can't ever remember not being able to visualize in three minutes. It's you know the one talent that I actually have, mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. hard for me to imagine this not having this ability. Like it'd be hard for me to imagine not breathing. You know, it's it's that natural to me. Um, so I always have to think. Um, extra about well, okay, so they're not going to understand this. So I, get, I need another three of you here and another one there, and you know. So again, and then what I love about the the renderings is that they're kind of a in a way a worst case scenario. You know, the, the renderings are not intended to beautify or, or make it more beautiful than it can possibly be. It's not an artistic, and but then when you put the the after photo right next to it, they line up exactly, and it's because you know my rendering is. The construction drawing they're the same thing so if the contractor built it the way it's drawn which they do because you know, they don't have any other real options you know so the roof height is the roof height and that so it's it's always and it's remarkable sometimes and and i and that now that i have a couple of these things done where where you have because i've been doing it for about maybe five years this way at the most um but now the early ones are, are done and built and photographed and uh um, and so we, we just put one right next to the other, and they line up exactly. So it gives my current clients, they look back and they say, okay, I get it. This that I see now is going to really look more like this photo, right? But um, mm-hmm. uh, so th- that helps. The first ones were harder because I'd say, yeah, yeah, this, this looks great. I guarantee it looks great. Um, you know, but they would say they would see just the rendering, which looks good, but it doesn't look great. You know what I mean? Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable, which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Now back to our show. Yeah, and you, so you showed me, we're going to put all these on my blog because these, if you don't mind, right, we'll put them on business. Yeah, please do, please do, yeah, yeah. And uh, these are some just great, great images. You sent me, I don't know, 14 or 15 images here, uh, maybe more than that, but you have a before picture, mm-hmm. you have a rendering picture, and, right. yep, so you have the rendering, and they're all taken from the same viewpoint, and then you have the after image. And, and I tell I tell people that that because uh, this is this is one of those things that, that gets under my skin sometimes, um, you know they they can't imagine what I could do, so therefore they do nothing. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Just because you can't imagine what I could come up with doesn't mean I can't imagine. Again, that's the one talent I have. So um, so that's a uh, for me. Uh, I use these as marketing as well. You know, I show people the befores the renderings and the afters just so that they get it in their mind that oh, I can do a lot more than what they can imagine. And that's what I want them to, to know. That's why they're hiring me. You know, it's a, like any architect. It's, it's the same. I, I love that. I love that. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you're aware, uh, a couple of weeks ago I interviewed uh, Robert Ivey, the CEO of the AI, uh, came on the show <laughs> to talk <laughs> about the new AI campaign, which is, um, they're titling it, I Look Up, you know, very right. aspirational campaign about uh, you know, the metaphor of looking up at the art, et cetera. And the the stated goal of that is to help improve the improve the public perception of what architects do right. and the value that architects add as right. designers and as professionals. And there have there have been, you know, um there's this divide between the sole practicing uh residential architects and then the more corporate institutional architects that seem to uh be more in line with what the AI generally puts out there. So right. sort of this divide that we all know about. So there's a lot of interesting comments. Thank you for all those of you who came on the blog and posted your reaction to that. Uh, Robert Ivey is actually going to come back and hopefully address some of that, you know, from the AI's perspective. But mm-hmm. one thing I got just from looking at your images, and that's why I mentioned it, uh, Peter, is because just looking at these images, I'm able to see the value that you provide as an architect. Well, thank you. You know? And I could definitely see how powerful this would be, like you said, to help someone understand who's not a professional that there's things that you can do with their house that they cannot even imagine. And and it's and for me though, you know, the, the quality that, that I think is the most essential quality that I have, it might be two of them, is 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 just listening, 
right? So, so for me, you can see in my projects, they don't all look alike. No. Uh, they're, they're very, very much focused on the aesthetic of my client. You know, so I, I get like this little Christmas gift every every time I get a new client. I open up and find out what the aesthetic I'm going to be working on now is, and um, and what I do then is make that aesthetic as beautiful as it can be, also practical because it's you know again you can't be well, but um, but I'm I'm you know practicality for me you know especially when you design a home it's really you know in some ways a machine that you live in, and so you know kitchens are. You know, they, they either work or they don't, and, and if they don't, it's it's bad, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and you know, things like locations of powder rooms. I mean, I remember being in a house where if you were seated on the toilet and the door were open, you could see the TV in the family room, and um, <laughs> it's just awful, awful. You know, because of course you can hear everything and all that kind of stuff. So, like the worst conceivable location for a powder room, and they found it. I mean, I guess. Yeah, the worst conceivable location, and uh, and so we, we were able to change that. But but people don't even know that like you know you can move a powder room, yeah, pretty easily. You know? Yeah, and so, yeah, so it's 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 you know, but it's for them. So I'm not trying to design a house that that I would move into tomorrow because I'm not moving into their house tomorrow. Um, and so for me, that that listening, and then you know figuring out what that aesthetic is and how to make it you know better than you know, they can never make it themselves. So that's, uh, that, that's what I do. Excellent. I'm, I'm looking at, I'm just going to talk about some of the images here. I'm looking at this one that's labeled K and J. It yeah. looks like sort of, um, kind of a Cape Cod knockoff style house is the original, you right. know, and, and uh, then I flip over to the rendering and you've gone with a very nice, uh, batten board, uh, yeah. vertical, uh, with some stone, uh, wainscoting around the bottom and you've added an entry uh, I as an architect I can see what's going on here I see how you've broken up the massing mm -hmm. you know I can see how you've pronounced the entry and given a lot of focus by adding this beautiful timber yeah. entry portico you've given it some um, some hierarchy by mm -hmm. raising and, and enlarging one of the dormers you know right. I, I enlarged all the dormers but I, I raised the height on the middle one mm. do do you do you explain to your clients what's going on here, why it looks so nice? I mean, when they look at it, they probably think, wow, that's incredible. Do you kind of tell them, hey, listen, the reason why we're doing this is because of this? I mean, how much of the education does it go into what these images show here? Yeah, I probably, I probably did more of that earlier. It's, um, it, it's a little bit like uh, going to a restaurant, right? So you go to this great restaurant, and it's all organic, whatever, and you get this meal that's unbelievable. You don't then ask the cook, well, wait a minute. How much exactly cumin did you put in here? Because I, you know, so so I used to do more education than I do now. But what what I try to do is is get a real good feel for everyone's aesthetic, and even if they can't name it, you know, like I want to do mid-century modern. It's pretty easy to name that one. Mm -hmm. Karen's was harder because it wasn't really quite a um, specific style, and so she wanted her house to be very casual, but at the same time. Very elegant, and, um, and which is there can be polar opposites. You know, elegant could be, you know, Versailles on the on the on the extreme end, um, but that's not casual in any you know anyone's book. That would be you know the opposite of casual. Um, so every decision we made was 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 how 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 is this casual and how is this elegant at the same time, and uh, and so we chose you know this. Um, you know, she, she said, well, it's kind of like a Maryland farmhouse, isn't it? And I said, no, Maryland farmhouse isn't elegant enough. Mm. It's not unelegant, but it's not elegant enough. And she goes, you know, a week later, she comes back. It's really a Maryland horse farm, isn't it? Mm. And I said, yes, that's what it is. That's mm. exactly our, our style. And, um, and so, so we, we ended up doing that kind of thing. But I don't tell people why I'm accentuating the entrance or or that kind of stuff. They just know that it looks and feels great and we move on from there. They just get it. Excellent. Well, and there, there's a remarkable transformation here. You know, I encourage those of you who are listening, go check out this episode, you know, episode 94 with, with Peter Tui. Take a look at uh, the way he's presented these images because I think you'll see, you really have to see it to understand what a powerful visual tool this is, you know. And, um, okay. and I love, when I was looking at these, I'm like, geez, I'm going to have Peter take a look at my house, you know. The transformation <laughs> in some of these is remarkable. <laughs> And that's pretty good coming from one architect to another. You know, it's the, uh, you know, he shows a lot of versatility here with different different stylistic um, styles, but then just 
you know, um, great, 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 great buildings, Peter. Thank you. So I, I was with the versatility part. I, I think I have a, and it's probably, um, what is it? It's uh, attention deficit aesthetic syndrome. So I, I really am looking forward to the next aesthetic. I've done a house um, not too long ago. This, this couple, very young couple, both of them not even 30, I, I believe, uh, came into my office and said they wanted a, um, uh, a mid 18th century, so, so mid 18th century Greek revival. So I joked in the office before they were a client. I said, well, a late 18th century Greek revival wouldn't be good enough. And their jaws kind of fell and, and they looked, said, no, not even close. And I looked it up after. And of course, now I know. But, but the, uh, the, by the late 18th century, they, they were really McMansion y. But, but mid or early 18th century Greek revival were very simple homes that were also very, very elegant. Not casual, but, but very, very elegant. And, um, and so we designed that for them. And, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful little house. It's almost done. I love it. Maybe you can share some pictures of that when you get yeah, that well, up, Peter, and we'll, we'll put it on there so people can see that. Yep. So, Peter, just to finish up, tell me a little bit about any tools or resources that you found useful for helping you achieve what you have with Archicad, using it as a tool. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's a training, you know, um, maybe it's not as difficult for the younger generation to think of the conceiving of their building as a model as opposed to a drawing. You know, so when I was growing up and we did plans and sections and elevations and these all took time and, and you would overlay one piece of uh, trace paper or vellum or mylar onto another. And, and so, so the, it took a while to transfer all that knowledge into this. It's really the model. And so I'm spending time on the model from day one. You know, I, I don't do anything other than the model, and uh, and then we keep adding detail to it. Um, so, so, so the, the training for that, you you have to be an expert at that uh, with that tool. You know, in the same way a contractor is, you know, so, so they're an expert at the tools they use, and um, and so this is just another tool. Um, and you know, again, I like ArchiCAD. I've also used Revit, but it was more than 20 years ago mm. uh, when I was in Germany with the, the, that firm used Revit. And um, so I, I don't really have any comment, you know, but AutoCAD, which was the industry standard for years, probably still is, you know, I, I find to be almost useless if it's still the 2D drafting tool that it was back then. And I, I hear they, they keep adding the 3D element, but, but again, I haven't used it in probably 15 years. So... So for me, the the um, making sure that you're up to date and, um, and and an expert, not not just good, but an expert um, at, at whatever tool it is. You know, and again, mine's Arc again. So so I am, and that's uh, that's been that's made all the difference. You know, again, like ten years ago, I was very good. At, at Archicad, but not an expert. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, I took some courses. Eric Bobro gives them, and I took his courses. I'm way better because of his teachings, and because of the time I put in. But you know, again, you know, his teachings, and um, and so, you know, I can, I can do this now. Um, Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. And, and, let me give you one more, just one more thing. I, I see a lot of these three-dimensional drawings, and, and they look like computer games, right? You've probably seen them as well. And, and I, I can't really show those to clients because they, they can't make the jump from this computer game, um, which ArchiCAD will make a computer game-looking rendering if you let it. Mm. Uh, so, And I'm sure Revit does sort of the same thing. And, and I find it to be not helpful for the clients, again, because that's that's all we do, right? right? We're trying to make their dream come true and their dream better than they ever hoped it could be. But um, but it's for their imagination, right? And so I, I always looked at these drawings and Kitty would, would yell at me if I ever even thought about showing it to a client because they just weren't good enough because they had too much sort of baggage. Like, you know, they looked like a, you know, the old what, Doom or Quake or whatever and then there's going to be a space alien right around that corner. We're going to have to shoot it, right? <laughs> so, um, and so, so getting the, the view to look right, and, and the story I tell people is when I was a, uh, you know, get work for that other company using ArchiCAD, I showed my boss one of these. And he said, you know, Peter, this looks like crap. And uh, so I went back to my desk. I knew it would look great. And I just traced it. Just the rendering that I just done, just traced it. 
put it on his desk. That that took two two and a half hours. It was a big rendering, and um, and then he goes, "Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Why did you even waste my time this morning?" Because mm-hmm. even he couldn't get past how the how the rendering sort of made him feel and mm-hmm. look at what it actually was. Mm-hmm. So so to me, that the secret is finding a way to present the drawings in a way that's aspirational enough. And again, I don't think my renderings are beautiful, but they're aspirational enough, and they don't, I don't think they have any negative baggage with them. Mm-hmm. They don't look like a, like a video game, and they don't have that feel at all. So it's, a, it's, it's not easy, but it is important. That's what I'd say. Peter, do you have any parting thoughts for our listeners that you wanted to share before we end today? Uh, well, I would say I would say anyone who's trying, uh, who's who's um, thinking about opening up their own office, one of the most important things for my success was was getting a, a, a great mentor. And again, I fell into it, but but I can't emphasize enough how important that is. So I would would get that out first, um, and then you know, and again, like ten years ago, internet marketing wasn't really, I don't think, important for architects. It was important for people selling other things, but not you know, the not architecture. And I completely disagree with that now. You know, so now all of my clients find me through house or through my, my website and, um, and or referrals. And those are basically the three ways that they find me now. So learn enough about the internet that you can, you know, it, it, it becomes a tool and then you have to use it to your advantage. So I would highly recommend doing that too. Excellent. Thanks, Peter, for joining us today. Thanks for joining us in the Business of Architecture. It's been great having you. Thanks, Ian. Really appreciate it. It was, it was fun. Good. Look forward to meeting in person. Yep. Just, a, just a, like a month, right? Yeah, that's right. Perfect. Looking forward to it. Okay. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.